Ladies and gentlemen, welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of the largest and oldest wrestling family on the planet. Listen to what I'm saying. That's right. Bring that camera in here a little bit closer. Through 93 years and four generations the stud has arrived old school or new fan this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories i want those people out there at home to hear the stud sit back and enjoy the ride with the tennessee stud the tennessee stud You will learn that name, you will remember it, and now, the stud is here. Hey everybody, welcome in, it's David Summers, it's another stud cast with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. It's the story of wrestling in America, as told by the stud, whose family started the profession 100 years ago. Now we step back into the ring, and back into time. Let's get hooked up with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller, find out what's happening in the Great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. What's up, stud? Oh, geez, man. Uh, doing good, man. Actually, Dave, uh, uh, kind of moving, man. Kind of moved to out of Cosby and uh, over into Sevierville. Uh, and the bear, I think the bear kind of ran us off, man. He got a, <laughs> he got a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, uh, excited and obnoxious. And, uh, you know, so uh, uh, we felt like we might better get away from there. Well, you have a history with bears. We know that for sure. So, <laughs> so is my granddad. Right? Ab- absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I think that's kind of how how it all began. Hey, I tell you what, as we get going, what a remarkable response last week, and it's still coming in for Studcast episode number two sixty. That was a ton of fun. More than an hour and a half long, five year anniversary of your Studcast run. It was an honor to do that with you. You've created a unique wrestling podcast, a weekly dive into the chosen career of your family that's captured the hearts and minds of wrestling fans. I'm talking all over the world. So to celebrate number 260, there were no less than 10 stars of the sport with us last week. That was so much fun. It was an awesome example of the respect you've attained in the sport from some of the greatest wrestlers of all times and many of them hall of famers that really was an honor well thank you i appreciate it dave and uh and you know uh it wasn't the stud cast that i originally had planned but uh man i wouldn't change a thing about what happened i'll tell you that and i really appreciate you uh throwing a little <laughs> surprise at me there and uh and i want to thank all the fans out there for their congratulations for this uh number 260 the stud cast uh five straight years of history i think it is and uh discovering, uh, you know, that I kind of enjoy sitting in front of a microphone every week. Now I've gotten used to it. Uh, I think, uh, I think I'd miss it, man, if it, if it didn't, if it wasn't happening. So, uh, I really enjoy it. I want to thank all those fans that sent their congratulations and all that. And, uh, obviously the guys that were on there with us last week. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, you know, uh, if, if I can continue, you know, it, it as I've been for the last five years, I got to looking at this man and thinking about it to tell my family story and my own story, basically. And uh, the story now of my four territories, we're into two of them at this point right now. <laughs> and a week, you know, going a week at a time, it's going to take me, I figure, about another 10 years <laughs> to, to end up with my wrestling career. So, uh, and then I got to thinking about that, and and you know, Dave, that that'd be I'd end up with about eight hundred stud cats. Uh, first of all, stud, I hope I live that long. So, <laughs> 10, 10 years. Wow, can you see yourself sitting in front of a microphone for ten years? That would be an incredible legacy, stud. The entire history of the oldest and largest professional wrestling family in the sports history in podcast format. Hey, I'm not going to put it past you. It may happen. And we're going to keep going, right? 
Oh yeah, man. Yeah, we're we're definitely going to go plod right on, man. You know, and uh, but the thought of that's a little bit scary, man. And it's pretty far <laughs> beyond where I'm prepared to ride today. I can tell you that. <laughs> we're, we're, you know, so uh, at this point in uh, July, let's kind of get, bring people back since we had an episode that uh, kind of got away from the normal format. Uh, so uh, where we were at the last. At the last studcast in which we were really doing the two territories, we were in July 1978, and both territories, if both of those southeastern territories had been combined, it would have made Southeastern Championship Wrestling the largest wrestling territory in the United States. So it ran basically from the Gulf of Mexico, extended north, almost to the state of Ohio. And, you know, the crazy part about it is the fact that my life story is basically just beginning. You know, I mean, we're, we've done five years and we're just really starting to get into this meat of the wrestling thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, there, there's like a, a true roller coaster ride of highs and lows, man, in the future stud guest. Uh, it's tremendous. We're going to talk about tremendous crowds. We'll talk about huge new markets added. Uh, we're going to talk about some pretty great success, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. But we're going to also talk about some things that are unthinkable, man. Uh, How greed and disrespect uh, uh, that came about, and that's going to appear maybe to have almost killed the dream. So there's a heck of a lot of uh, story still to go, man. Wow. Wow. Okay, but I, like so many of of your fans out there, know only so much about your past. I do know that you're you're taking us behind the kayfabe curtain every week. I think that's pretty cool. And I can't wait until we get a little further down the road. Your personal wrestling story is definitely intriguing and one of the best ever, I think. All right, stud. So where are we riding today? I noticed the title of this episode is Working Both Territories. You've been going back and forth between the two southeastern territories Seems like flying mostly, but sometimes driving. That's a pretty long road. Oh, yeah, man. It is a pretty long road, especially if you're driving. I can tell you that. And, uh, you know, and, and I've been back and forth between the territories a lot in the first four months since we opened Southeastern Gulf Coast down there. And uh, now after about two months, uh, uh, I haven't been back to Knoxville for at least two months at this point. And I'm getting a chance to go home to Tennessee again in this episode. So uh, I was definitely not on, not, not, it wasn't for a vacation that I was going back to Tennessee. I'm going to be wrestling three times, playing in a charity softball game, flying back to Florida and getting in the ring there, all in a period of less than three days. So we're going to start this stud cast by discussing the cart. I was on in Knoxville Friday night, July 21st, 1978, in the Chill High Park Amphitheater. We'll talk about the TV promoting that card. We'll talk about the results of that card, and then we'll cover the attendance. Hmm. And then we'll talk briefly about the softball game that even had a little drama of its own uh, <laughs> that was going to lead to some pain for me in future matches. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, then I'm going to head south to home number two, Pensacola, Florida, uh, wrestle on the same night as I spoke about just a second ago hmm. after the softball game. On the afternoon of July 23rd, 1978, catch the plane, fly into Pensacola, wrestle again. So uh, then we're, we're going to focus on the card in Mobile, Alabama on Tuesday night, July the 25th, 1978. And we'll talk about the TV promoting that card, the results of the matches there. And we'll talk about the attendance there. And then given enough time, Dave, if we haven't overloaded the boat again, you know, <laughs> we'll finish another learning tree question. It would not be your first time overloading the boat, Ron. So we'll see. All right. Hopefully we'll get, I think we'll get to that. All right. So we, we begin the sixth year of Studcast, Ron. And as always these days, it's going to be another pack one, no doubt about it. So what was on the card? Knoxville. I think we're talking Friday night, July 21st, 78 in the chill Howie park amphitheater that took you, you got in the, you got in the car or on the plane, 500 miles North. Well, luckily, man, I got on the plane for this one, thank goodness, you know, and I did fly out of there, you know. And so uh, let's start with the opening match on that Friday night, uh, June, July 21st, at Chelsea Park Amphitheater. Uh, 
And there, the new baby face in that territory, man, was Kevin Sullivan, and he was getting hot, man. And he was squaring off with a guy who was his first event, uh, Abdul Zatar. Uh, Rip Smith and Bob Root were going to be wrestling against Dennis Condry and Ron Wright because uh, there's a match coming up that's going to keep Phil Hickerson busy. Uh, Robert Fuller was facing off against Don Carson, which that had happened many times in Southeastern's history, but that thing is going to come to a head pretty soon here. Phil Hickerson, Ron Wright, Dennis Condry had all three conspired the week before to win that 1978 Ford LTD Landau in the tournament. And uh, Jimmy Golden was in the finals, and by golly, uh, they got it done, the three of them. And Jimmy wanted, obviously, another chance to win the car. And uh, so that'll be discussed when we get to the TV show that's going to be promoting this card. We'll talk about what Jimmy, Jimmy's idea here. So the main event featured my coming home for the first time in more than two months. I'm going to partner with Ronnie Garvin against a great Malenko and the Mongolian Stomper managed by Don Carson. And uh, Garvin mm -hmm. and I were going to be seconded by my brother, Robert. Hmm. All right, that's that's really a great card, Ron. The LTD Landau. Okay, so it's back at stake. Plus you and Garvin as partners. How long had it been since the two of you had been partners? And let's. I think you're. You know, let's go over the TV deal six days before this card, where you were setting everything up for this big card. Well, you know, I don't think, uh, Dave, as a matter of fact, I don't think Ronnie Garvin and I had ever been partners in a tag match wow. in the eight wow. years that we had known each other. Hmm. We never wrestled as partners. And we're going to wrestle as partners on July the 21st, 1978. Uh, the, we're going to talk about the TV. Uh, let's jump into that TV. Uh, Saturday, July 15th, 1978. It was the second one in the July rating period in that month. And uh, wow, this TV was a loaded one, man. Uh, the card from the night before had been headlined by that Ford LTD Landau tournament. And the TV opened with less in a close up, running down the card for the day for this program and telling fans there was a big surprise in store for everyone on this show. He didn't tell them what it was, but he did lay the foundation for a big surprise. And then as the cameras backed away, Jimmy Golden was sitting with him at the set. And he had that big TV championship trophy that he had won the week before from Dennis Condry sitting on the desk between him and Les. And behind them on that big giant backdrop was the still shot that we had pretty much every week and every show uh, that would pertain to what had happened the night before, basically. And it had a shot of the referee laying on one side of the ring. It showed Ron Wright in the ring with a full nestle on Jimmy Golden. Phil Hickerson was all reared back, man, to deliver the finishing punch, man, to, to get himself a new car. So uh, Les told the director, you know, to hold the shot rather than, you know, them jumping right into it. And, and he began the program by apologizing to Jimmy for what they were about to see, the fans and Jimmy and everybody in the studio, for what people at home, what they were going to see, he wanted to apologize to Jimmy right off. And Les said he had seen some real robberies in the ring. But what happened the night before in that match for the finals and for the car, and he pointed over his shoulder at the steel shot, as he was saying it, was one of the worst thefts he'd ever seen in wrestling. <laughs> and, uh, and he explained how Wright got in that shot, you know, because there was Wright had Jimmy in a full Nelson, and, and uh, Higgerson's about to let Jimmy have it. So, you know, he explained right where, where, why Wright was there and uh, that Ron Wright had taken advantage of the referee being knocked down. And he just jumped in the ring where he didn't belong, nailed Jimmy, basically put him in a full Nelson. And, uh, you know, uh, he asked the director then about this point. He uh, Les said, go ahead and roll the, roll the video. So he said, uh, and I was in the studio. I was there in Knoxville for the TV. So uh, I got to see this one myself. And Les then finished his little intro by saying, "I want to, let's show him the rest of the best car theft. <laughs> that was a good way of putting it. So uh, <laughs> Jimmy kind of took over from there, man. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. basically they stole the car. It is Jimmy what it is. Jimmy wasn't any doubt about yeah. it. And yeah. fans are going to see it right yeah. here, you know. So 
Jimmy took over and he started <laughs> describing what was on the screen, man, on TVs all across the southeastern part of the country. And Hickerson threw the punch. The video rolled. Hickerson threw the punch. And then Jimmy ducked. And Ron Wright was the guy that got nailed. And he got sent flying through the ropes out of the ring. And then uh, Jimmy continued to take over the, the video portion as it, it as it developed from there. And then Jimmy picked up uh, Hickerson and uh, he slammed him. And then he suplexed him right in the middle of the ring. And then he climbed up on the top rope. And, uh, and he stood there for a second because Hickerson's a mighty big boy. And he took a pretty big <laughs> suplex. So Hickerson didn't bounce right up on his feet. So Jimmy climbed up. He's standing on the top rope waiting for Hickerson to get to his feet so he could drop kick him off the top rope. And that was going to be the way he was going to beat him, man, mm -hmm. and get that Ford car. But wow. then, you know, Les broke in at that point, say that uh, that he says, but Jimmy, you know, this is where things really went way too far. And then the video showed Dennis Condry running from the dressing room. Jimmy standing on the top rope. He doesn't see Condry coming. Condry climbs up on the apron of the ring. He shoves Jimmy in the rear end. Jimmy goes head first, head over heels off the top rope, and uh, lands on his back in the middle of the ring. Wow. Condry ran from the ring, and Hickerson <laughs> crawled over on Golden, and the ref crawled over to count Jimmy out. Uh. Car was gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Les told Jimmy, you know, he'd been asked. He said, uh, you know, Jimmy, uh, I've been asked on behalf of Southeastern Wrestling, uh, you know, uh, Don Curtis and uh, several other people, you know, to apologize for you for what happened here, you know. And so Jimmy asked Les, uh, you know, he said, uh, what, what you can do for me, Les, is can you ask Phil Hickerson to come out here to the set? I want to talk to him. So Les did. He asked for Hickerson to come to the set. And uh, obviously Hickerson showed up, but he showed up with Dennis Condry and Ron Wright at his <laughs> side. So you know, Jimmy's sitting down there with Les and he jumps up. Obviously he didn't expect all three of them to come and he kind of backed away from them. And there you were trapped in that studio if you were behind the set. So, uh, you know, uh, he, he backed behind Les's chair. Les got up and stood between them and he asked, you ask Hickerson and uh, Wright and Condry says, I don't want to have any problem here. Uh, you know, Jimmy wants to say something to Hickerson. So uh, Hickerson screamed at Jimmy. <laughs> and he says, what the hell do you want? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hickerson, he was an old country boy, man. And he, he didn't care. He didn't try to stop anything. He, he did what he felt like. So Jimmy told the three of them he had checked to see how much that car cost. You know, he had talked to the dealership people and he found out that that car had cost $7,500. Wow. You know, this is 1978. Yeah. You can't yeah. buy a car like that anymore. <laughs> Landau, kind of LTD, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but 1978, you know, that's a lot of money. Yeah. So, uh, and so he says, he said, I'd be willing to put up $7,500 to get another shot at the car. He said, if I lose the match, Hickerson can have my $7,500 and obviously the car. Ooh. He said, but if I win, I get to keep my money and I get the car. <laughs> so so Ron Wright and Condry, they both started yelling at Hickerson right there. And they said, do it, do it. They go, we'll split the money with you. You know, so Hickerson <laughs> dropped his head. And he was kind of thinking, now, he was giving this some thought, you know, about, wait a minute, you know, do I really want to do this? And then so Hickerson finally answered, you know, and he, he pointed at the big TV championship trophy that was sitting at the desk right there where between Jimmy and, and Les, and uh, it was right in front of him. And he says, <laughs> you know, and the trophy and the title that Jimmy had won from his partner the week before, that's, you know, he had just, Condry had just lost that TV trophy. Mm -hmm. So he says, Jimmy Golan, he says, uh, I'll do this deal. He said, I'll give you that that opportunity, uh, you know, if you'll give my partner here a shot at that TV trophy on today's show. He wants to win it back, basically. That's the mm -hmm. whole deal. Yeah. So, you know, 
Lesk was a little bit hesitant, you know, but you could tell he was like, oh, I don't know, Jimmy. And and uh, Jimmy wanted to, you know, and he asked Jimmy, he said, he, you know, you don't have to answer this right now, Jimmy. You can think about this if you want to. And Jimmy didn't hesitate more. He said, uh, he said, OK, you've got it because the studio crowd pop, man, they wanted to see it, obviously. And so Les asked Jimmy if he was sure. Jimmy nodded yes. So uh, Les told everybody that the TV trophy match was going to be on the show, and but it would be on the last match of the show today on that day. Wow. All right, so that's a really cool opening to a TV show, off to a great start. But what about the big surprise that Les mentioned at the beginning of the TV show? That Was that it? Well, no, that, that wasn't actually the big surprise. But, but Les, man, he was pretty sharp. He, he hmm. saw an opportunity here when it developed to uh, take advantage of it. So Wright and his team left the set uh, along with Jimmy. And uh, so Les got on the phone. There was a phone on the desk on the set. Uh, and people, uh, I got to bring this up real quickly. Uh, next week, I believe it's going to be next week or the following week, mm -hmm. we're going to actually be doing the show that we have, the only show that, show that we ever had of TV from 1970s from Southeastern wrestling. Hmm. We're going to show the entire show. You, we're going to tell people where they can find it and they'll be able to see that show. So uh, they'll see that there's a phone on that desk. So, uh, you know, uh, Les grabs up the phone mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, he, he, and he actually what he did is he moved the surprise, the <laughs> surprise match, the one that he was talking about from last to first. Yeah. So, so, you know, what had happened is he got on, they talked to him upstairs. Yeah. They said, okay. They sent the wrestlers in that were going to be in the last match into the ring. And uh, so uh, uh, Les was really pretty cool about it. He was really sharp about that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. He he stepped right in. He took it upon himself to switch the matches, but uh, made it a lot better TV show. You know what? I always wondered what about the phone on the desk. I always thought it's a gimmick. It's not even a real. It's just something to clock somebody over the head with. But, <laughs> <laughs> but all right. Then fans were about to get the big surprise on the show first, plus a TV championship match at the end of the show that was not even scheduled. That's correct, man. So uh, <laughs> this TV show during rating period had just gotten better. Like I said, wow, it, it really improved dramatically. So uh, two opponents were already out there in the ring, and uh, Bell was rang for the first match, and the uh, opponents were there, and around the corner came Ronnie Garvin and me. We entered the studio as a tag team. I hadn't been seen or even mentioned there on TV for months, and uh and I had never been a partner with Garvin. So the studio exploded. Uh, no one expected this combination or match, I can tell you that. The crowd never sat down. And Garvin and I, we really destroyed those poor boys that were in the ring waiting for us. And then Don Carson and the Mongolian Stomper and the great Malenko, they all three rushed to the set while we're taking care of business in the ring. And they started asking Les, what the heck's going on here, man? You know, and they said, why was it that uh, we weren't told who Garvin's partner was going to be next Friday night? You know, what's mm -hmm. Ron Fuller doing back in town, basically? Mm -hmm. You know, why didn't we, why weren't we notified? So, uh, and, you know, the fans were really, really into this match. They went crazy when they saw us together. And then uh, there was kind of pandemonium in the studio. Garvin jumped off the top rope and one of them's throat, as usual. I put the fuller leg lock on the other one. And then we went to the set and we took the entire two minutes of the first interview. And uh, we just kept the crowd standing. They had never sat down since we walked in the studio. And uh, we just uh, kept them going, man, uh, in that two minute interview. That's a great first segment to start a TV show. Plus, you've got a championship TV match still to come at the end of it, right? That's correct. And the studio man was rocking. And the next match kept it going. Uh, the great Malenko and the Mongolian Stomper by Don, managed by Don Carson. Uh, they were in the next match. So uh, they got uh, just as many boos as we got cheers. And uh, I think they wanted to make us, us look bad. Uh, they attacked their opponents before the bell even rang. And uh, I believe they were doing their best to, to beat them quicker and uh, in, in, a, in a more uh, a harmful way than even me and Garvin beat ours. 
in the first match. And uh, they left both of them laying, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and then the same three of them were on the personality profile live, right there in the front of the studio crowd. Uh, and they tore into Don Curtis, man, for keeping them in the dark about my returning. Among other grievances and complaints they had, they had about four or five minutes worth of complaints and things that they didn't like. And uh, they they just kept the studio audience making as much noise as like a match was going on. The fans were just booing them like crazy who had thought there was a match going on. So, man, at this point, that TV was really rolling. Uh, Phil Hickerson hit the ring. He's in the third match. That's going to keep it rolling. He's, he's, he's in the prime part of all this program. And then Ron Wright and Dennis Condry, they joined Les at the set. They bragged on their man in the ring how much that he loved his new car. They talked about how they were going to celebrate Dennis Condry winning his TV trophy back in the next match on the show. And then they talked about how they're going to spend Jimmy Golden's money starting next Friday night. <laughs> Big party and then no telling what. Wow. So, uh, wow. It's already been a wild TV show. Then there's a number of wrestlers uh, – started to appear in the studio, man, for the TV championship match. Things got even wilder. So Dennis Condry, he came to the ring. He was escorted by Bill Hickerson and Ron Wright, naturally. And when Jimmy came around the corner with the big TV trophy, he was followed by Robert Fuller and Bob Root. Wow. All right. So this TV has been lit from the start, and it looks like you, you're about to pour some gasoline on it. <laughs> that's a good way of putting it yeah so it kind of reminded me man of one of those nights when you've got a big arena full of people you got a huge crowd and when every match seems to get the fans more turned on man the studio crowd I, and i'm sure those at home were ready for this match man they saw what was going to happen there's two guys standing in one corner two guys in the opposite corner uh, the two guys are going at it for the TV title. And uh, so both Condry and Golden, man, they end up bleeding in this TV match. And it was a long TV match. It was a, probably close to 20, 25 minutes, which is a long time for a television match. And uh, that just led all the other four, the wrestlers were standing there watching all that time. Uh, to, to they, they couldn't stay out of the ring. So obviously it ended up with all six men in the ring. And uh, that called, obviously, for a disqualification of both Condry and Golden. But Jimmy still retained his TV trophy. And uh, and he also still had the opportunity to win that beautiful car the next Friday night. <laughs> That's cool. All right, listen, this is a really big TV for considering ratings in the month of July for 1978. So let's talk about the following Friday night. What's up there? Well, Kevin Sullivan, man, he continued his winning streak. He had been undefeated since he came, uh, and he beat Abdul Zatar. Uh, Bob Roop and Rip Smith won over Dennis Condry. They beat Ron Wright, and, uh, you know, Ron Wright was hard-pressed to, to hang in with guys like Roop and Smith. Uh, he had a, a lot of age as compared to them young boys, it, uh, those guys at that point. Uh, my brother Rob ended up getting disqualified, and Don Carson uh, was awarded to win, uh, you know, uh, you know, but by DQ, he didn't beat Rob. And wow, that was a bloody match. I mean, there's no love loss between Rob and Don Carson. And uh, so then Ron Wright and uh, Dennis Condry, they did their best, man, to get a victory for Phil Hickerson in that Ford LTD Landau versus the $7,500 challenge match with Jimmy Golden. And in the end of it, it was Bob Root that did the dirty work this time instead of Condry and uh, Ron Wright causing uh, Jimmy to lose. Uh, Bob Roop had a, had a big part in causing uh, big Phil Hickerson to lose. And uh, Jimmy ended up with that LTD Landau for good, man. He drove that car for years. He loved that car. So then the last match of the night, Ronnie Garvin and myself uh, with my brother, who was second us in the corner. We were wrestling against Malenko and the Stomper, managed by Carson, and uh, we won uh, by Garvin and I, uh, but it was by disqualification. Uh, Don Carson got his glove loaded at the end of that match, and he hit everybody he could see with it, it seemed like, man. 
but my brother got the worst of it. <laughs> and um, Rob was there to try to watch out for us. Carson was there to take care of them. And the glove was, uh, he really put Rob, uh, the, Rob ended up bleeding again. Uh, it was it was really nasty. He had a couple of really nasty cuts. And Garvin and Malenko ended up having to be pulled apart. They were really, really at it at each other. Most of the match, at the end of it, it was just crazy at the end. Uh, but uh, uh, by then, almost every wrestler had to leave the dressing room, man, to come down to pull out everybody apart. It was a wild finish to it. And then, uh, so, you know, let's talk a little bit about the match with Robert and Carson. They've been at each other's throats uh, since Don Carson got involved in that hair versus hair match between Robert and Ron Wright, which was on January 15, 1978, mm -hmm. in the Coliseum. Six months earlier, mm -hmm. Rob had wrestled Ron Wright, hair versus hair. And uh, for those who remember and for those who do not, uh, Rob lost his hair that night, even though he won the match. Yeah. Right? Yes. Due to Don Carson, right? Yep. And uh, so after Rob had beaten Ron Wright, uh, Don Carson interfered, and uh, Rob was the guy that lost his hair. That conflict was coming to a head, <laughs> pardon the pun, <laughs> as both men were so upset with each other after this night, this Friday night, in which they had both been bleeding, fighting each other, and then end up fighting again on the end of it, that they both agreed that they were going to put their hair on the line against each other. No time limit, no disqualification, that there was going to be a must-be winner to the match, that they were going to have it the following Friday night. So Rob's putting his hair up again. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, so I remember the hair versus hair match between Robert and Ron Wright. Robert won. And the, the crazy thing is when Wright refused to let the barber cut his hair, your brother took away the barber's shears to cut Wright's hair. He was going to do the job himself. Don Carson comes up behind Rob with his loaded peanut butter glove, knocked him unconscious, and then did the dirty deed, shaved Rob's head before he came to. So Robert had only had his hair back for six months, and this time was putting it on the line against Don Carson? <laughs> You can imagine that. I mean, yeah. That's got to be really disliking somebody, man. Yeah. I mean, I'll, yeah. You know, but uh, I think Rob got to seeing that, just getting that picture of Don Carson with all those, those the dyed blonde hair mm -hmm. gone and his head <laughs> shaved, you know. And uh, so that's right. That was going to be the main event for the next Friday, hair versus hair, Robert wow. versus Carson, the main event. Well, that, that had to be an incredible draw. So how about attendance? Tell us about the, the rest of that trip, the night in Harlan and the Sunday afternoon playing softball. Something happened to you. you got a lot to cover here. Well, I'll tell you, the, let's start with the attendance. The Knoxville attendance was another really large crowd, man, 6,300. Uh, more than we could. It, it was uh, probably equal to the – the uh, Harley race and match with mine in the Coliseum where they cut the ticket sales off. Uh, Harlan, Kentucky, I was going to be the wrestling there on Saturday night. Uh, when I went to Harlan, man, it was just the same old Harlan as I remembered, man. And, uh, and I was pretty popular in that town. I hadn't been there in five months. And uh, on that night, we set an all-time record for Harlan, Kentucky. We put 3,700 people in a gym that was made to hold 3,000. So we almost had a quarter more in that building than what it was built for. So uh, the next day, I was able for the first time to play with the wrestlers in one of these charity softball games that mm -hmm. we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, and at this point, it was exactly 17 days after the Panama City riot where I had the stitches, put my right arm yeah. got cut with a knife right, and uh, had some stitches on top of my head from being hit with a chair, <laughs> steel chair from behind. So, uh, so it's, it's summertime, obviously. And, uh, and so I wore shorts to play in, right? It's a softball game. Right. right. Yeah. And then, and then in the course of the game, Dave, I hit one man over, 
you know, it didn't it didn't clear the wall. It's a baseball stadium, right? Mm-hmm. So it didn't clear the wall, but it went way over the guy in left field's head. So I had an inside part home run. Whoa. You know, yeah. I hit a home run, but, you know, he had to run to the fence, and then he had to throw it to somebody, and they had to throw it to somebody else. And yeah. So I actually <laughs> – but when I got to home, I had to slide in, you know? Yeah. And then when I slid in – uh, and I got shorts on, bear yeah. in mind. Yeah. And I collided with the catcher. Uh, and, uh, and I reached down with my left hand to catch myself. And I broke my finger, my big finger on my left hand. Dude. <laughs> and, and at the same time, I slid, right? So I burned this huge hunk of skin off my left hip, uh-huh. you know, because I had shorts on, man. You can imagine when you slide in that dirt, uh-huh. you know, it uh-huh. just it just took the hide off. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. So there I was, man. My stitches had barely been taken out, you know, and now I was going to have to tape my fingers on my left hand together for months Mm. because of that broken finger uh, to get past the finger injury. And uh, (laughs) it's a pretty nasty deal, man. Are you kidding? I mean, so. (laughs) I I wish I was kidding. (laughs) You had all these dangerous matches. You get hurt in a charity softball game. <laughs> All right, I'm not. I am laughing. Okay. Oh, yeah, I know you are. Yeah. And I, and I, I gotta laugh about it too, man, or I'd cry. Yeah. How about yeah. the iron? The irony of that. I know. Well, you know, such such was the life for me, man. That year, you know, I had a lot going on. So, uh, and and as bad as that finger bothered me, you know, but and it does. When you have a broken finger, you you know you can't. You can't grab you you you. It, yeah, I started tying it with to one finger. I tied it to my 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 ring finger. Yeah, and that wasn't enough. And I ended up by a couple months in tying one whole all four fingers together on my left hand. Oh wow, pretty wow. hard to wrestle that way for months. Yeah, uh, but as bad as the fingers was and the finger was and the hand, the 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 wrestling the hip man that. Uh, you can imagine a wrestling match just like about like sliding on sand in a in a baseball stadium. Yeah. So every time yeah. I went down on my left side, uh, I ripped off that skin, man, that layer of skin again and again. Good God. And it seemed like every night for the rest of that summer, I burned my butt and and, uh, and I wanted to I wanted to cut my hand off sometimes. All right, so I think this is a good place to take a break before this picture keeps coming up in my mind. So thanks thanks a lot for that, stud. All right, so, hey, this is a good spot for a break. Let's do that. We're going to be coming back and headed south to find out if you're going to get hurt in southeastern Gulf Coast <laughs> when you get back. I'm not doubting anything at this point. Y'all stay with us. This stud cast will continue in a moment. Hey, I, I, I'm going to break in right here, Dave. Uh, you know, you normally do these, but uh, I've got another another important event that I just want to spend a l- couple of minutes here uh, to talk about that's upcoming now. Uh, I had a great time in Gatlinburg. I want to thank all the people that showed up in Gatlinburg. I uh, met a whole lot of fans. I uh, had, had a good time there. Uh, but there's an even bigger one that I'm going to this next weekend uh, that's going to be in Knoxville at the Knoxville Convention Center, beautiful facility downtown. Uh, this one is a huge event. It's an annual event. It's been there for many, many years. It's called the Fanboy Expo. Uh, been there, as I say, a long, long time. And uh, I'm going to be there on Saturday and Sunday. This weekend of August 6th and 7th, uh, both days, and I'm going to be in the uh, in the uh, with the the great little uh, company there that uh, Three Crows Entertainment is. Uh, be looking for the Three Crows Entertainment booth, fans. If you come there, uh, I'm going to also be there with Dirty White Boy in that same booth. Uh, Tim Horner is going to be in that same booth. Uh, we're going to be signing pictures. Uh, we're going to be uh, bringing some things for sale. I've got the Brutus. I've got uh, 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 many, many different types of things, T-shirts, uh, uh, photographs, all types of things to sell. I'm going to bring my USA Championship belt, uh, photos. People want to get their photos taken with the belt. They're welcome to do that. Uh, we're going to have a great weekend. And uh, this one is a huge event. There's a lot of people in Gatlinburg. But this one, they tell me, I've never been to this before. 
is about three times more people than what was in Gatlinburg even. So uh, I want to invite everybody to come out this weekend. I want to say hello to everybody, have opportunity. And I, another thing, I want to, if people have old memorabilia from the 70s and the 80s, the programs, things like that, that they want to get signed, uh, bring them out. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity for you to get something really special. Uh, you, and uh, I did a lot of those. I'm bringing this up because in Gatlinburg, I signed a lot of those old programs and things. And uh, wow, the fans just really love it. They have opportunity not only to show it to somebody, but have the autograph too. So a uh, great event, Fanboy Expo, uh, Saturday and Sunday, August 6th and 7th. That's this coming weekend. And uh, please come on out. Everybody have a great time. Look for the Three Crows Entertainment booth. Uh, Dirty White Boy, Tim Horner, and myself. And uh, we're going to have a great time. And uh, uh, look forward to seeing everybody in Knoxville at the convention center Saturday and Sunday. That's awesome, Stud. All right. Let's get back into it. You have returned from Knoxville on this Studcast to Pensacola in the southeastern Gulf Coast Territory, and it's Sunday, July 23rd, 1978. So where do we ride from here as we rejoin this stud cast? Well, we're, we're, now we're south, obviously. We're 500 miles south from where we started in this stud cast, and we're going to look at Mobile, Alabama's card on the same week that we talked about uh, as the Knoxville card we discussed at the beginning of the stud cast. We're going to talk about that TV that promoted the card. Uh, we're going to talk about the results of the card, and then we'll give the attendance there as well. So uh, let's get right to it, Dave. Uh, Mobile's opening match was Charlie Cook versus Eddie Mansfield. Mike Stallings was meeting David Schultz again. This time, dig this one, this match was the loser of the match had to kiss the feet of the winner. Okay, they've done all types of different types of matches. But uh, yeah. this one, uh, whoever yeah. lost had to kiss the feet of the winner. Oh, so, uh, so then the next match here was Tony Charles, who was really fast becoming a star down there on the Gulf Coast, man. Uh, was in a loser leaves match uh, with Eddie Sullivan. And uh, they had been battling back and forth. Uh, Sullivan could not beat him in anything they'd done so far. Sullivan challenged him to a loser leave, and Tony put, uh, took him up on it. So uh, next match was going to be a special challenge match. Bob Armstrong was going to be up against the United States karate champion, a uh, great friend of mine, personal friend, Ron Slinker. In fact, he's going to be seconded by me uh, that night in Mobile. Mm -hmm. And then there was a Southeastern Gulf Coast Tag Championship match. The champion assassins, managed by Billy Spears, were going to be defending against Ricky Gibson and Wildman Fargo. And then the main event was going to be yours truly, Southeastern Gulf Coast title match, and I'm going to be defending against the wrestling pro Leon Baxter. Wow. Wow. That's, I mean, that just sounds legendary. That's a, all right, that's a six-match card and a really good one, too. A loser leaves, two title matches, and Mr. Goody Two-Shoes against Slinker. So Knoxville only had five matches. Mobile must have been doing pretty well. Wow. It was, Dave. I mean, uh, it had quickly become the best drawn city so far in southeastern Gulf Coast. Hmm. Uh, and uh, there were two beautiful buildings on this property in downtown Mobile where the where the buildings were. Mm -hmm. One of them, the smaller building, was called Expo Hall. It held about 5,000. And right next to it was the municipal auditorium, and it held about 12,000. Wow. So sometimes, uh, back in the early days when we went there, we had to run in the bigger building if the smaller one was booked, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So on this particular event, uh, we were in the bigger building, and and thank goodness for it. So uh, so let's take a look at the TV that was promoting this card. In the second week of July, 1978, in TV rating period, man, right in the middle of it, right? So the last Southeastern Gulf Coast TV we talked about two weeks ago before we came back and uh, did the uh, the big show uh, 
uh, for the five years, the celebration show. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about this Gulf Coast TV tournament being on television. And uh, we already had the first round of that TV tour championship trophy tournament. And David Schultz had beaten Wildman Fargo in the first tournament match. And Charlie Cook beat Eddie Sullivan in the second tournament match. Hmm. Uh, that was on the sh last TV show we talked about. In this one, there were two more tournament matches on this TV show. Tony Charles was going to be in the first one on this TV show versus Mike Stallings. And then the last of these tournament matches would be on the last match of the show. It's going to be Bob Armstrong against Eddie Mansfield. So the show opened with Gordon Soley and Charlie Platt talking about the continuation of the TV championship tournament. They had the big trophy set in between them. And, uh, and I was not there for this TV. Uh, obviously, as I just, we just talked about, I was in Knoxville. And uh, so Bob Armstrong told me uh, in Pensacola when I got there on Sunday night, when I got back from Knoxville, that the Tony Charles and Mike Stallings babyface match the day before on TV was spectacular. He said, wow, Ron, it was unbelievable, you know, for a babyface match. And he said the fans were as into it as they were every other match on the show. He said they, they really, really loved it. Uh, obviously, uh, Tony Charles won it, you know, and uh, he said they both shook hands at the beginning of the match and they both shook hands at the end of it. He goes, and the, everybody in the in the studio stood up and applauded them. Tony Charles split the first interview with his opponent in the upcoming loser leave match with Eddie Sullivan. And then the David Schultz. Watch the video where he beat Mike Stallings. They won the $2,000 from the recent elimination match. And it showed his win in the match. And then it also showed Stallings attacking him afterward. And he opened the cut on Schultz. And, uh, and, it, and it was a lot of blood in that video. Wow, Schultz bled like crazy. And, uh, you know, rather than uh, the heel attacking the baby face, the baby face attacked the heel. So uh, Schultz went to the ring uh, in the TV match. As soon as he got watched the video, he was very angry anyway, watching that and to seeing what uh, Stallings had done. So uh, Schultz went to the ring and he demolished his opponent, man. And then he returned to the set and he split the interview with Mike Stallings. And this was the match that we laughed about earlier. This was the match in which the loser of this match was going to kiss the feet of the winner. <laughs> okay, so so you know these guys they they had had all kinds of matches. Now now Stallings has busted Schultz open big time. Schultz is mad, so that's the deal for this match. So uh, that's on the program. Then the next thing up was the personality profile, and it featured the brand new arrival, the United States Karate Champion Ron Slinker. Now, he had never been in the Gulf Coast area at all ever before. And he was scheduled to meet Bob Armstrong in a special challenge match. And uh, Charlie Platt and Gordon Soley, they started out by questioning about where I was since I was scheduled to be second in him in the matches against Mr. Goody Two Shoes. Where is Ron Fuller? You know, and uh, so and <laughs> this boy was a pretty good interviewer. And he, he said, uh, that's none of your damn business. <laughs> he said, he said uh, y'all should just play the video. He said, I brought a video here. And he goes, it's going to show everybody me winning the United States Karate Championship. He goes, you should mind your own business and play that video. You know? Wow. So they ran it, obviously. What are they going to do, right? And uh, wow, Bob Armstrong told me it was an extremely impressive video. Wow. I mean, this this guy was really, really a, a karate expert. So uh, then he, he did, demanded to see the video that, uh, that he said, Ron Fuller told me when I came here that uh, I should see the video that uh, of where Bob Armstrong hit me in the throat uh, after I had uh, after I'd beat him, you know, in the middle of the ring. And so he watched <laughs> that video after they watched him win the, the United States Karate Championship. Mm -hmm. Then they watched uh, Bob Armstrong uh, be, a, uh, you know, Bob hit, hit me with a karate chop for no reason. After I'd beaten him, he was very upset. And uh, so then they watched that video and then he got very uh -huh. upset when he watched it. 
you know, and he said something about the, what a cowardly attack, Bob Armstrong, you know, mm-hmm. that used on me. Yeah. Uh, on Ron yeah. Fuller, my great friend, you know. Yeah. And after the match was over, he says, you know, what what kind of guy does that? And you know, and, and he said, <laughs> and he said, that really explains to me about why a lot of my friends and, and Ron Fuller uh, tell me that Bob Armstrong's a dirty player, man. And uh and here he is now. <laughs> he says, and they, yeah, he says he's yeah. a dirty player. That's all it is to it. <laughs> and he says, I'm here now and I'm gonna show Armstrong what real karate is all about. Mm, okay. okay, so that must have been a pretty interesting couple of videos. I, I'd love to have seen those. It sounds like that entire profile was exactly what it was intended to be. Yeah, you know, it, it was great. It was, it was exactly the intent. You know, he was talking to a guy that's his first time there. They introduced, they showed some videos, you yeah. know, but, uh, Slinker had an attitude and uh, he couldn't help himself and uh, and it worked out great. It was a great one. Uh, You know, Bob talked to me about it and uh, I couldn't wait to see it myself. So my friend, he'd laid down the law to Mr. Goody Two-Shoes in my defense and he wasn't (laughs) finished yet, right? So the third segment of the show had Billy Spears and his assassins were at the set with their belts and they were going to watch the end of the last TV show. Now, the fans remember that. That was a. It was a mayhem. It was crazy, right? And uh, Spears was complaining, watching the video. He claimed that he and his men had innocently come in the ring the week before, and they took a little photo opportunity, you know. And then they were savagely attacked by Ricky Gibson and his crazy fin friend Wildman Fargo, <laughs> and uh, before they could even start the match. Mm-hmm. Against their scheduled opponents. He said the scheduled opponents were so horrified they ran from the building. You know, so uh, so Bob Armstrong uh, you know, told me that when they left the set, Ricky and Wildman Fargo came to the ring for the next live match. And the studio went crazy, man. They loved these two guys. And uh, so Spears and the assassin came out of the dressing room toward the end of the match. And they were basically there, I think, just trying to, Bob said, to distract Gibson and Fargo. But uh, they never entered the ring. There was no contact between them. But Gibson and Fargo, uh, man, they they took care of business there at the end of that match once those boys came out of the dressing room. And uh, the group of that five of them, uh, Spears and two assassins and uh, Gibson and Fargo, they talked about in the next interview about their upcoming championship match. Hmm. And then the last TV match was the last match of the first round of the TV championship tournament. And the huge trophy was placed in the center of the ring, uh, Bob said. And uh, and it had, just as it had been for the first trophy match in the show. And Eddie Graham, Eddie Graham, I'm sorry, Eddie Mansfield. God, there's a big difference between Eddie Mansfield and Eddie Graham. I don't know where Eddie Graham came from. But anyway, Eddie Mansfield and Bob Armstrong were introduced. They're in the they're in the last match uh, of the TV tournament. So both Charlie and Gordon uh, made their unusual prediction uh, during the course of this match that uh, they thought the winner of this match, obviously, and they thought the winner of the tournament was going to be Mr. Goody Two-Shoes, Bob Armstrong, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and I'm sure at this point, you know, uh, he was he was probably really backing up what they were saying. I'm, you know, he's wrestling against Mansfield, and Eddie Mansfield was greatly overmatched, man, in the ring with Bob Armstrong. So I can imagine Bob was just dominating, you know. And then uh, Eddie was <laughs> Eddie was probably running for his life and uh, doing whatever he could to just uh, to keep from getting beat. <laughs> and uh, and he kind of grabbed uh, you know uh, Bob around the waist, uh, and this is what. Uh, Slinker told me, he said, uh, Mansfield kind of grabbed Bob around the waist in desperation to keep him from just uh, uh, getting totally humiliated. <laughs> and he said, uh, uh, Armstrong grabbed a little headlock and Mansfield fired him into the referee. Bam, the referee went down. Uh, and so did the other two. You know, Bob had collided and, uh, and Mansfield was already about to lose. He fell on his face too. So uh, my buddy, Ron Slinker, with his judo jacket on, man, slid up into the ring behind where Armstrong was getting up. And when Bob turned around to look for Mansfield, he found Slinker. 
And boy, he got a throat full of one of those powerful karate thrusts, man. One of the best in the world. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and Slinker said, Bob went down, man, with like a like a heap, man. Mm. Hands clutching his throat. And Mansfield covered him. The referee counted him out. And Mr. Goody Two-Shoes was eliminated from the tournament. Whoa. I bet the I bet the studio was only slightly shocked. <laughs> I guess they were. Man. <laughs> I guess they were. Wow. <laughs> so so Ron Ron Slinker told me, you know, when I saw him the day afterward, you know, in Pensacola, uh, that Armstrong could hardly speak in the last interview. They ended the show. He said he could hardly talk. He was all he was all choked, <laughs> choked up. So uh, wow. uh, I got a good man. That's the yeah. deal. I got a good man, man. <laughs> you know, sometimes sometimes you think the guy that's never going to be beat gets beat occasionally. It does build character, and it makes people go, wow. That's It, it just makes them see it differently. So, really, that was an incredible – that was a really good TV, uh, as good as Knoxville. So, wow, even though you were completely – everything was completely different. So – who is moving on in the turn tournament for the next show? Okay, so in the tournament, there were still four men left in it. Uh, the two winners from the first week, David Schultz uh, and Charlie Cook, both won their matches in the first week. They're going to wrestle each other on the next TV show the following week. And then the winners of this week's TV shows, the two winners, Tony Charles had won and Eddie Mansfield had won. Mm -hmm. They're going to wrestle each other uh, the, on the last match of the next TV show. Mm -hmm. And the winner of both of those two matches then are going to meet the following week, which is going to be the last Saturday in the month of July mm -hmm. for the TV trophy. Mm -hmm. All right. You still got Mobile for the next Tuesday night with the, that really good card right there. Well, Charlie Cook, man, uh, went out and beat Eddie Mansfield. Hmm. Uh, and it wasn't the first time he beat Eddie Mansfield. Okay. That's for sure. All right. <laughs> so, All right. Was the next match the loser had to kiss the feet of the winner match? I, I want. I want to hear about this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, that was the deal. So the loser was supposed to kiss the, the <laughs> wrestling shoes of the winner, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But but David Schultz won the match, and uh, and him being the winner, uh, you know, and him being David Schultz. He had to take it to the next level. So he took his wrestling boot off <laughs> <laughs> and his sock off. Of course. <laughs> and he insisted that Stolly kiss his foot. <laughs> <laughs> My bare foot. It was barefoot, yeah. all sweaty and nasty. And, yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, so <laughs> I, I was there. Right. So, you know, mm -hmm. the, that crowd was booing like crazy, man. So Stalin's, you know, he, he acted, you know, he was like hesitate and he's going to bend down there. And, you know, people thinking he's going to do it. And then he stomped David Schultz. Uh -huh. his foot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. What a pop. Yeah. <laughs> that building exploded, man. So, so Stalin's in this, he stopped him and then he flew out of the ring. He went to the dress room. He left, man, and boy, they were, they were a roar from the crowd. He left to a big <laughs> roar. And then David Schultz sat down, rubbed his poor foot, man, and he really milked it great, man. And the fans were just, they loved it, boy. And then finally <laughs> Schultz got up and hobbled back to the dressing room <laughs> with a shoe off, one oh, shoe off. Oh. So, um, so Tony Charles, you know, Tony Charles had begun to build a legend there, man, in the southeastern Gulf Coast. And uh, this loser leave match here uh, was a it's his first big win uh, to 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 really push that legend, man, to beat Eddie beat Eddie Sullivan, and uh, he's going to make a big name for himself down there. So, and it was time then for the special challenge match between Bob Armstrong and the United States karate champion, Ron Slinker. And I was the second in Slinker's corner. Uh, Mr. Do Goody Two Shoes, he, he got the win, but I, I got the heat I needed after it was over. I had an opportunity after he got his win for me to put the boots to him a little bit. But, but I had to be very careful, man, because, you know, we were in Mobile. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to start a riot. We got two more matches, right? 
So I can't just go crazy on him because if I do, I'm going to have a ring full of people and that may be the end of the show, right? So uh, so I didn't get to do exactly everything I wanted to do to him. So, so then the time for the Southeastern Gulf Coast Tag Championship match between the champion assassins managed by Spears against Ricky Gibson and Wildman Fargo. And uh, so we recorded this match because uh, – you know, this was going to be the largest crowd uh, that we've shown a video of so far. And it, I knew it was going to look great on TV. We had planned to do it. And uh, what happened is we were in the bigger building, Dave, and, uh, wow, we couldn't have put all the people we had in into the small building. Mm -hmm. So, wow, it turned out to be really a treat, amazing piece. Yeah. So, and, and as it should be with any great angle, uh, no one saw this one coming. We've got something special for them here. So Gibson and Fargo, they've been a really good team, man, and uh, and worked very well with each other. It really gotten over. And on this night, man, they looked even better than they had ever before. They looked great as a team the entire match. It was like there was no way that they weren't going to win the belt. And the building, like I said, was full. The crowd was exploding time after time. And, I mean, they were – that mobile was a tremendous wrestling city. So Ricky made a huge comeback. Uh, he got a hot tag from Fargo at the end of the match. He made a huge comeback. Uh, he threw one of the assassins into the other. He knocked Spears off the apron. Spears jumped up. He knocked him off the apron or the ring. Uh, then he uh, drop kicked one of the assassins from the top rope and sent him through the ropes out on the floor. And then he went back up and drop kicked the second one from the top rope. And he covered him right in the middle of the ring. Spears. And the other assassin still outside on the floor. Uh, gosh, man, everybody in the building thought the belts was theirs. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and the crowd, it's one of those deals, the crowd could just sense it. This is it. Mm -hmm. And they were going crazy. So, the uh, you know, Ricky covers the assassin and uh, the referee begins the three count. And at the count of two, wild man Fargo comes running into the ring and drops a knee in Ricky's back. And that building went totally silent. Wow. And then Fargo took something out of his tights and he busted Ricky open. He pile drived him. And then all three of them started stomping. You know, the old helpless Ricky, man. Uh, so Charlie Cook, Mike Stallings, Tony Charles, they all had to go to the ring to save him. And, uh, and the crowd band started to push the ringside. Uh, there was a crazy, crazy crowd in Mobile. And they started to push their way up the ringside. And Fargo and the other three, uh, they left the ring. But, man, they left with a brigade of policemen surrounding them. I learned the first night there hmm. that we needed to have a lot more cops than what we had. And uh, now we had a brigade of policemen for every card. Wow. Thank God we did wow. for this one. It was in a big arena. It was in a lot of people there. And uh, it was like I said, a parade a brigade of policemen surrounded those guys. Yeah. And, uh, and at this point I had, had an opportunity to talk to the police and let them know, you know, what they needed to do and how important their job was. And now they were kind of on our side, but they did a great job, not only protecting the fans, but the wrestlers themselves. Uh, so all the heels got back to the dressing room in one piece, which was great. Uh, Ricky Gibson was carried back of the, to the ring by the three guys that went to help him. And then I closed out the evening with a win right in the middle of the ring over the wrestling pro, uh, Leon Baxter. Wow. That's a great night of wrestling. Luckily, everybody made it home safely. So how do you, what kind of house? Big, big night? Well, luckily, like I said, because we, we were, weren't in the expo hall because it was rented and we had to move the bigger building, uh, the, there's no way the Expo Hall could have held this crowd. Uh, we had 6,100 people, Dave. The two biggest events of the week wow. in, the, in the territories, uh, we sold 12,400 tickets in Mobile and, and, uh, and uh, Knoxville alone. Wow. In that week. I keep forgetting this is 1978 you're talking about, and those are still, those are still big numbers. All right, that's amazing, Stud. Mobile's crowds were already almost as big as Knoxville. So it looks like, yes, let's do it. We're going to move into the final segment of the show today. 
It's another learning tree question. Let's see if we can get that done. Our question comes from Albert Townsend. He says, your 260th stud cast was absolutely amazing, loaded with big name wrestlers and an excellent commentator. When you started your first wrestling company, did you ever have any idea that you would have the success that you did along the way? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. Uh, well, I'm glad you enjoyed the show, Albert. Uh, you know, and uh, and thanks for thanks for this. It's a good question, you know. So, uh, I get, I like to put my thoughts together a little bit. You know, uh, uh, you know, long before I ever became a wrestler, I, I dreamed of following my father and my grandfather. Uh, not only to become a wrestler, but I also wanted to be a promoter. I wanted to own a wrestling company. Uh, from, from from five years old, it seems like, you know, uh, and I saw my dad and my grandfather wrestle, both of them, uh, but I uh, also saw their their success as owners of companies, and then it really inspired me as a young kid. So the I guess the first wrestling company I owned, Southeastern Wrestling in Knoxville, it scared me almost to death. I mean, uh, many times I thought, that success was not in the cards for me man, when I got to Knoxville. Uh, I, I did not know, man. I struggled mightily in the first two years there. I, I thought after uh, my first four years as just a wrestler in the sport, in the business, that I knew how to do it. But I found out again and again I was wrong, man. Uh, being a good wrestler does not automatically make you a good promoter or owner of a wrestling company. I mean, uh, they require totally different skills and, and a totally different mindset. Uh, so had it not been for many of my wrestling friends and family, you know, I don't think I would have ever made it, you know. Uh, and luckily, I learned from them and, and others in the business the important things, the things that made the difference between success and failure. Uh, I can remember, Dave, my wife and my sons and I, mm -hmm. we went hungry. Some in the beginning, when I first became an owner, mm. uh, we we <laughs> we struggled to put food on the table sometimes. Wow! And and I wondered if I had made a mistake. Maybe I should have been satisfied with just being a wrestler only. So uh, even those hard times were good for me. You know, uh, I learned to never give up on your dreams, even though sometimes they seem absolutely unattainable. Success may be always closer than you think. So uh, so I, I was congratulated quite a bit on the last studcast I did uh, by some people that helped me make make it, you know, and, and in my, with my wrestling companies uh, to make them a success. Uh, some of those guys on that show mm -hmm. uh, actually helped me get there, you know. And after that first company was successful, I was able to, uh, with the help of others, and only with the help of others, I and mean, I cannot uh, overemphasize how important that is. It, no one person can make a success of anything. It takes others. You got to have the right people and the right help. Uh, and with the help of uh, others, uh, I was able to make uh, uh, other wrestling companies that I had, uh, the, the second one, and the third one, and the fourth, one. Uh, all of them successful. So. You know, uh, I took those lessons, and again, with uh, with the help of others, after my wrestling company success, uh, I had some success again in a totally different sport, hockey, you know. And after that, I had success in the real business world, the uh, security business with ADT. Uh, mm -hmm. Legit, go to the office every day, uh, uh, do, do the thing, man, uh, yeah. that, you know, I'd never had that type of business before. So, um, wow, well, you know, uh, in my, my opinion, Mr. Townsend, uh, success is, uh, I guess it's often difficult to find, but, uh, but it only comes, man. I believe you only find success through the help of others. And, uh, and I, I, I depended upon that, uh, all my, all my career as a, as an entrepreneur. Wow. All right. I got to tell you, Stud, I'm really loving these Studcasts. I got friends who are keeping up like I am because obviously I'm hearing every episode in real time. 
I've got other friends, and, and we really enjoyed last week, other friends who were like, I'm on the road all the time. I'm up to episode number 257. I haven't caught up. I can't wait to get to number 260. So listen, this thing is really, it's, it's so much fun. I can't wait till next week. And folks, let me tell you on Facebook to become friends with Ron, you can go to his Ron Fuller, the Tennessee stud page. That's his Facebook page. Like him, follow him there, and you automatically become friends with a legend. On Twitter, follow him at Ron Fuller Welch. The website, you got to check it out. Visit the stud on this tremendous website, tnstud.com. It's got everything. Great videos, a photo gallery, hundreds of photos of wrestlers. Every stud cast, every stud cast ever done is absolutely free. You talk about catching up, you got a lot of catching up to do. And 43 three-hour super stud cast, they're only $2.99 each. Shop the stud store for all kinds of souvenirs, personally autographed photos, t-shirts, and the thrilling lion novel called Brutus. Southeastern Rewind on YouTube. It's still full of great shows and up-to-date information about Ron's fantastic streaming channel at ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. It's all there, always will be. Every week, things are added. Southeastern TV shows, superstars of the past shows, stars of the sport shows, Continental Wrestling TV shows, and so much more. Well over 135 hours now of old school wrestling entertainment over 135 hours and it's only the beginning subscribe now at classic continental wrestling.com classic continental wrestling.com it's only 4.99 per month 39.99 per year and it's fast becoming the best old school streaming site on the planet don't miss this special offer right now for a limited time Get a free one-week trial at ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. Dude. I called you dude, stud. I hope that's okay. Don't come out. I, I, I love you. <laughs> that's a lot. All right, stud. So where? how do you keep up with all that? But all right, where do we ride to next week? Well, Southeastern Knoxville, man, like I said earlier, it's got that hair versus hair match between my brother Robert and Don Carson. And uh, also on that card, I didn't mention this, is going to be finally the first Russian death match. Uh, Malenko's been begging for it, asking for it mm-hmm. for months mm-hmm. uh, between him and Ronnie Garver. Uh, Gorgeous George Jr. is returning there next week to southeastern Knoxville. Uh, and in southeastern Gulf Coast, we got another guy coming in there that's a biggie. Norvell Austin is going to arrive for his first run along the Gulf Coast. And uh, we're going to have another six-match card with business exploding, man, in that uh, southeastern Gulf Coast territory. It was unbelievable. And we're going to also talk about my promoting an event in the same Dothan building where we wrestle, man, the the old Farm Center, man, that I'm going to promote something, Dave, that I had never seen, actually seen, done before. Hmm. And it was a tough man contest. Wow. Okay. So we're going to find out if I can have some success. We're talking about having some success. We're going to find out next week whether I could have some success doing something totally different that I had no idea of how one was even actually done. And I saw a little mm-hmm. piece of it, and actually a promo on TV. And I said, I want to do one of those. And uh, so I did it in Dothan. So Hopefully, and next week, uh, we're going to get to another learning tree question as well, man. Glad to get there this week. And thanks for the gentleman's com- comments and his question today. Uh, I want to thank everybody for your congratulations for the five years on the Studcast and, uh, uh, and those people that were on there with me. And please tell your friends and neighbors about us. Take care of yourselves and others. And may God bless us all. For Ron Fuller in the Great Smoky Mountains, I'm David Summers saying thank you for listening. Find me at David Summers Productions at gmail.com. This studcast is a David Summers production for Tennessee Stud LLC. Thanks for joining us today for this historic studcast. The true story continues next week. So full Nelson, your friends, and point them in our direction for another ride with the Tennessee Stud. One, two, three.
This is David Summers saying so long from the Great Smoky Mountains.